We're ready to ship from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Seattle, Washington, and Washington, D.C., courtesy of the Internet. And Mark, you've been following the Democracy Summit in Washington, D.C. You've been a very busy editor for Press Freedom. Last week, you were attending the Reuters conference. This week, it's the Democracy Summit. So what's our update from Washington, D.C. and Seattle, Washington? Thanks, Dean. The administration of U.S. President Joe Biden organized a Democracy Summit this week, which is one of several Democracy Summits that have taken place this year with various sponsors, including an event that was held earlier this year, the Almaden Democracy Summit in Sweden, which was co-sponsored by the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance and the Athens Democracy Forum, among other organizations. According to International IDEA, a decade ago, democracy was on the rise with 50 countries becoming democratic and a general consensus that democracies were most effective in fighting poverty, ending corruption and stopping civil wars. But the planet has entered a new phase where democracies are now being challenged all over the world. There are now more autocratic governments, more attempts to silence journalists and more attacks on the rule of law. President Biden's summit has been criticized by China, Russia and other nations who are not invited, who claim that they are also democracies, while some representatives that were invited to participate, including Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte represent nations which have cracked down on resistance movements and jailed journalists like Nobel laureate Maria Ressa, who is out on bail right now, but still faces several serious charges in the Philippines because of her reporting, which is critical of that government. The first session of the summit was dedicated to issues related to press freedom and included Ressa and fellow Nobel Prize winner Dmitry Muratov, a Russian journalist. Meanwhile, however, the Quincy, Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft held its own online conference, which was highly critical of the US for alienating major players on the world stage and for its own challenges to democracy internally, including gerrymandering, big money controlled elections, voter suppression in some states, and a news media which is monopolized by a few very powerful corporate entities. Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, launched the Democracy Summit with pledges to increase funding for independent news media outlets worldwide that are struggling financially. And that would be through the International Fund for Public Interest Media and USAID. Joe Biden is requesting an additional $236 million to shore up failing news organizations in his budget recommendations to Congress. There were also suggestions from speakers to provide joint funding for journalists investigating corruption on an international scale, because the second day of talks included a major session on corruption moderated by US journalist Andrea Mitchell. Ecuador's uh, Attorney General Diane Salazar stated that corruption is a major threat to democracy worldwide. And the president of Botswana, Mogritsi Maisi, pointed out that according to the group Transparency Without Borders, only four nations who recently signed on to an agreement to stop corrupt banking and business tra transactions are actually enforcing their own laws on foreign bribery. So it's a major problem around the world. And despite much criticism though, the rhetoric this year was somewhat promising when it comes to press freedom. Secretary Blinken cited Reporters Without Borders and their statistics on the deaths and imprisonment of journalists globally. Something I've been trying to raise attention about with my work as editor for Press Freedom for Democracy Watch News for years now. In the past, I've met with complete silence from public officials and complete ignorance and major news media organizations who seem completely unaware and disinterested in those statistics. By the way, Reporters Without Borders ranks the United States 44th in the world in terms of press freedom. So within the last couple of years, in part as a reaction to US President Donald Trump's previous adversarial role in opposition to the press, New initiatives have been launched by groups like the National Press Club, the Boston Globe, and even my own Seattle Times here in Seattle, which now supports a Save the Press initiative with increased reporting on press freedom issues. Secretary of State Blinken claims that the Department of Justice has now adopted new policies which discourage their subpoenas and prosecutions of journalists 
an attempt to obtain information that they've collected, including data on journalists' confidential sources. There is, however, still no federal shield law, which some states have adopted, to protect journalists from those kinds of prosecutions. And that's something that really needs to be done. So while the evidence is not in yet, the rhetoric, at least, has improved with a general consensus at this conference that reporters and media workers should be supported and protected, especially small independent and local news organizations. The opening session on press freedom was entitled Media Freedom and Sustainability and was co-hosted with the Netherlands. And it included, as I mentioned before, Nobel Prize winners Maria Ressa and Dimitri Murata, and, and also Agnes Kalamar, the Secretary General for Amnesty International. The Democracy Summit is scheduled for December 8th through the 10th, and other sessions will address the future of the internet and technology, which has both helped and hindered pro-democracy movements around the world. It will also cover attempts to address human rights violations, uh, the status of political prisoners, and corruption internationally. But at least one session uh, entitled Leaders Plenary Session was not live streamed and was held behind closed doors, causing some concern over transparency issues at this supposedly democratic series of presentations. But most of the proceedings are available on demand at YouTube and on the US State Department's website. And day two's session was concluded with an address by US Vice President Kamala Harris. The Committee to Protect Journalists, which serves as an international advocacy group for press freedom, has reiterated that support for press freedom is critical to reversing the decline of democracy worldwide. In their official statement, CPJ urged summit participants to work for the release of imprisoned journalists, to combat the immunity for murderers of journalists and the legal attacks on journalists, and to protect journalists from surveillance and shutdowns of news agencies by authoritarian regimes. According to CPJ, quote, journalists are being attacked and thrown in jail in record numbers for doing their jobs. So this meeting can't be just another photo, photo op. And that came from Deputy Executive Director Robert Mahoney. Many independent journalists work under constant threat, says Mahoney, including in several of the countries President Biden has invited to his summit for democracy. He needs to ensure it produces concrete results to protect those journalists and media freedom. There is no true democracy without a free press. This is Mark Taylor Canfield reporting for Democracy Watch News in Seattle. Thank you, Mark. And we have a little extra time today. So if anybody has anything, any other commentary, any other observations, after we're through with the weekly news briefing, I will be putting our staff meeting on a Twitter space. But for now, anybody any other observations, anything else that was in your regular report? Anybody else on staff here has anything they would like to contribute? Uh, you, we have a few moments. Well, Dean, I am also covering a recall election in Seattle of our Democratic Socialist City Council member, Shama Sawant, who is uh, internationally recognized as a leader uh, she helped spearhead the $15 an hour minimum wage, which is spread across the United States. She's also worked in Seattle to, to, to extend a moratorium on rental evictions during the economic crisis and the, the pandemic. Uh, she is being attacked by conservative business interests who have poured millions of PAC money, millions of dollars of PAC money into the state, uh, and they are trying to get her off the Seattle City Council. So there's another example of how uh, electoral politics in the United States is not necessarily democratic, that it's often controlled by big money. Uh, it takes a lot of money to advertise and reach a large audience uh, during these kinds of campaigns. And you know, your average city council member does not have the resources to go up against huge corporations like Vulcan, the Paul Allen, co, uh, Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen's construction company, uh, folks like Jeff Bezos and Amazon and these, you know, multinational corporations. So as I keep saying, until we get the money out of politics in the United States, there will be no true democracy. And Sama Sawan, of course, has been on one of our episodes of Democracy Cast. So she is a member of those who have walked through our virtual doors and have sat down with us. And we're looking forward to your updates on that recall effort by the 
more conservative and business interests who object to her actions on the city council. We'll see how that works out with the citizens of the good city of Seattle. There's so much going on around the world. Um, we, we are studying to get some regular updates from areas around the world to our own correspondence. Correspondence for Democracy Watch News, should anybody be interested? We have a detailed plan assigning various positions around the world and around the US states and territories, same for Canada, same for provinces in Canada, same for Mexico. We've got detailed plans to expand eventually into Nigeria the same way, but every country has some assignments. These are not employees, these are clients. So if once a month you're, you wanna send us a digest or a full article for us to distribute, we'd be happy to work with you and develop a regular relationship and regular full correspondence reports that we may then distribute for journalists around the world. And by doing that, the bulk of the proceeds will go to the people who, who created the content, primarily the journalists, but we have separate arrangements. We can handle audio and video. We can handle data visualization through digital journalism. We can handle separately also visual images. So keep that in mind. And as we move Democracy Watch News forward in this next, over this next year, you're gonna see a lot of expansion, including into, into traditional tribal journalism, which is a distinct category around the world is an actual term. Don't send me messages about using the word tribal. It's become an accepted term now. So if we use it carefully and respectfully, we're all right. This is Dean Edwards in Salem, Oregon for Democracy Cast. This has been our regular weekly news briefing and I invite you to go to democracycast.lipson.com. You will see that as we can get these reports up, they show up in our Lipson feed. That makes it available through TuneIn Radio and Stitcher. It also makes it available through your favorite podcast provider. Most likely, DemocracyCast is there. And don't forget our new Instagram channel with all the work of Terrence Winder and Mark Taylor Canfield to bring those stories and make those available special for Instagram.com. Well as democracycast.lipson.com. We're gonna switch over now to another aspect of technology and John Harvey in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has our regular technology update for Democracy Watch News Weekly News Briefing. John? Yes, good afternoon, Dean, thank you. So the headline today, we'll start with that, is that Facebook has decided to open up its Horizon VR world to the general public. Until now, it's been in a limited beta, which was invite only. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how the community atmosphere changes with an influx of new people from the US and Canada right now. Other people have obviously joined using proxy servers, but that's against the terms of service. So today, Facebook's meta verse, so to speak, opened up to the general public. And if you're on there, I'm digitally wired, look forward to bumping into you. Last week, we talked about pizza services being automated and the fact that robotics is something that, like it or not, is moving into the consumer space. Previously, robotics really were something that happened in factories, built cars, and you know that type of thing. People were divorced from it. But all of a sudden, we're starting to see robotics replace low-end or minimum wage workers. This week, a coffee store announced that it was going into the robotics business. And the 
obvious advantage of robotics is that one can reproduce the formula, so to speak, so a cup of coffee or whatever flavor the customer orders can just be added to it by the robot, heated to the right temperature, put in the cup, sealed and everything else and pushed out to the customer. One really doesn't need people. And I think this is, you know, it's great. And as I said, some people do have concerns about it. And those concerns are very real in that we're creating a society where there aren't really going to be jobs for people that don't have real skills. And you, know, you may ask, well, what is a real skill? And I think that's one of the issues here is that something that can be reproduced over and over and over again in the same way to have a result is something that can be done by a robot. And as we're finding you know, people, when they think of robots, we think of external mechanical beasts, but artificial intelligence is something more internal. And you know, Gene and I have talked about tools for journalists. And one of the tools out there that's become very popular of late is a AI tool, artificial intelligence tool called Jarvis. And Jarvis enables one to do something as simple as, and um, you know, I could share my screen with you. In fact, why don't I go ahead and share my screen with you because uh, I can't. But Something as simple as entering into Jarvis, write an article about the influence of, of John Locke on American politics and clicking the enter button, generates three paragraphs of text that, you know, according to the Jarvis engineers, is totally unique. It makes total sense. I could read one paragraph. John Locke is widely considered one of the most significant philosophers of government and his ideas have had a profound influence on modern politics. So, I mean, that's just one sentence. And this is just written by AI. And obviously, you know, if you, if you read a lot of news these days, you're going to see articles that um, there's some mistakes in it. They duplicate lines and if you see that that's generally an article that's been written by an ai it's not perfect yet but it's really really good i mean it's just mind-blowing to be able to just tell it i want to write this article about this topic using this tone of voice even and you can add keywords to optimize it for search engines. So, you know, this is a tool for journalists, but the, I guess, proviso here is that, you know, at some point, and last week, a AI artist, so a, a piece of artificial intelligence that created art, that art was sold for over a million dollars. And so, you know, when are we gonna see the first best-selling book by an AI and, you know, when is the art of writing no longer going to be a, a human trait? So I'm going to leave you with those thoughts today. And this is John Harvey from Pittsburgh, hoping you have a great week. Cheers.